What's up, nerds? Uh, welcome back to another episode of In The Mix. On today's episode, we are going to be uh, jumping into the mix of a song called First Blush by my band Locket. This is one of my favorite songs off our album, All Out, which comes out in six days on October 25th. I really like how this entire uh, production came together. The way it came out is very smooth. Um, it's very full. I love the way the drums sound. I've uh, gotten several compliments on the way the drums sound. So this is, in front of me, I got the first demo. And this demo is from January 21st, 2018. Congratulations if you sat through all of that. So as you can hear, that demo has the exact same structure that the final song has. It is much more similar than it is different. So this was recorded January 21st. We started recording February 3rd. So this is like two weeks prior to recording. Yeah, when we went to record it, <laughs> I think we almost killed Brad because uh, we were working on the song and JJ, Travis, and I started going down the rabbit hole making like the chorus, like this heavy, big, like almost doomy like chorus. And Brad was like, I do not think the song should go in that direction at all. Um, so he like, he left the room and hung out in a different room for a while, seeing what we could come together with. And then uh, I think that just ruined the momentum for the night. And then the next day we came back and uh, we basically made it what it actually is. Let's jump into it. I'm going to play the actual song now, start to finish. Um, and then we will go in and we'll start dissecting the elements. Cool. Here we go. We have the session in front of us. The song is 115. That is uh, the BPM. We have the structure here. Intro, verse, anti-chorus, chorus, verse two, anti-chorus, chorus two, bridge, bridge two. I mean, it's just one bridge section, but it's uh, just a really good visual cue to, to separate it. This is how I usually do it. A reintroduction of the intro and then uh, kind of a final chorus. In red, we have the drums. In the dark red, we have samples. And we also have um, some effects and parallel compression, drum verb, tom verb, snare verb. Down here in the baby blue, we have auxiliary percussion. So this is all auxiliary percussion. This is integral to the song. Sorry, the transitions in this song are super smooth. And I think a lot of that comes from um, the abuse of all these aux percussion elements. Going down, we have the bass in yellow here. And then all the way down here, these are all guitars. And then these are all the vocals, which I have temporarily committed um, to just the, the vocal master just because I downloaded this session from Dropbox half an hour ago. And for some reason I was getting playback errors on it. Okay, so let's go through. We're gonna start with the drums here and I'm just gonna solo all the drums just so we can kind of take a listen to it. Okay, so you kind of get the picture. This song is not like a big washy song, which really allows you to turn the room mics up and kind of get like maximum uh, room sound on the snare. And like, you can hear those open hats. Uh, they sound lovely in this room here. That's a perfect example right there. You can really kind of compress the hell out of those room mics and it adds a lot of character into uh, into the drum mix without like just completely turning into a washy mess that destroys your mix. Even in the choruses, um, it's pretty light. And let's play the actual chorus over here. Let's remove all the samples and just play it without. And we'll give that a listen. We'll see what that sounds like. As you can tell, the drum sound hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, the kick is the major difference there. And I so we recorded a, uh, a, Ludwig, a Ludwig kit from the 70s. Um, and it's JJ's drum kit. And JJ has an amazing drum kit. And he's got amazing cymbals. And it, he plays the drums really well, which makes drum recording very easy. But I found on this recording and across the album, I wasn't huge on the kick drum sound um, that was captured. So I rely a little heavier on the kick in sample 
to just kind of like really punch and give it the tone. So this is just the kick sample. So as you can hear, very slappy, very full. On top of that, I also have an overhead sample. Now these are samples I didn't create. These aren't samples from the kit. These are samples that uh, I've collected over a long time and uh, I like the way they sound. So together, just the samples, the kick in sample and the kick overhead sample. So that alone sounds like a great kick drum. Now what the mics are doing, so this is a kick out mic, which usually sounds pretty crappy on its own, but it has a lot of roundness and kind of like low end to it, which um, blended in um, just creates a warm kick drum sound. And it adds a little bit of human feel to the, uh, the entire kick drum sound that we're working on here. And then the kick in mic. Honestly, I could probably mute that and uh, Do you feel we don't even need the kick in mic. Uh, the sample's doing most of the work there and uh, to me it sounds good. So that's the kick drum. So let's go and listen to our snare top and snare bottom. So as you can hear, it's a good sounding snare drum. So let's hear what the sample is doing. I'm going to play the close mic sample. So as you can hear, it's just a good sounding close mic sample. Fat, it's bright, it's punchy. And then this is what the uh, overhead and room sample are doing. It just kind of adds some like depth. And uh, you can turn up the overhead sample by itself and it kind of gives the illusion that you turned up the room mics without kind of... Um, introducing a lot of unwanted bleed. That's a huge advantage advantage of uh, using an overhead sample on, on a snare drum and a kick drum. So let's listen to the kick and snare together. <laughs> there we go. It sounds big. Moving forward to the toms. I do have a room sample. This is something I sometimes do. Sometimes it doesn't work. Let's see what I decided to do when I mix this track. Yeah, so it's just like a room sample on the toms. I find sometimes uh, tom samples can get a little squirrely. Uh, but in this case, I decided it was a good idea. Big 16-inch floor tom. And let's keep moving forward. There's not really too much there. Those are the overheads. As you can hear, you can hear like uh, the picture of the full kit. It sounds big. And again, not having cymbals blasting lets you kind of turn those up and get a, uh, a big drum sound um, without it being totally washed out. This is my first pair of room mics. So I'm definitely compressing those. So I'm nuking those. I have the all button selected on this, which is just uh, means like all the ratios together. In the yard of my that is, I'm able to do that, as I've mentioned like five times already, because there is not a lot of cymbal work. So I can really crank that and that's going to add a lot of like pump to the drums and a lot of personality. Without the room mics, we have a tiny, tiny room. With the room mics, that's the sound right there. Um, that is one of the biggest reasons why when I'm recording a rock band, I do not cut corners on having the appropriate dr drum room for the recording because you just can't get that same energy through plugins, you can you can get halfway there, seventy percent of the way there, but you can't get that like real big drum room sound um, with reverb or samples um, the way that I like. So whenever I record drums, if I'm recording a rock band, I like to record drums in a big room. That's drums. I've talked about these drums in two other in the mix videos, so there's not really too much more I can jump into. I'll take a second here and look at the chat and see if there's anything uh, sticking out. Uh, 
Um, kick out mic is some kind of condenser. I like to use a Coles 4038. It's like a ribbon microphone um, that I have, and it's it's super warm sounding. The only thing is this ribbon mic, so if you have it too close to the kick drum, it starts to like crap out, and you're going to break your microphone. But it is super, super, super warm. Like The top end is just naturally rolled off that microphone, and uh, I love the way that thing sounds on outside kick drums. This is one of the most exciting parts of this song to me. And this, we have all of the aux percussion. Let me kind of take a quick look here at what we have. Um, so we have the go-tos. We have shakers. We have tambourines. We have like a tambourine with reverb on it um, that you hit just on the snare hits. We have all these cymbal swells. We have a floor tom swell or like roll. We have rim shots. We have maracas. <sighs> Insane. Let's listen to what's labeled here as Chorus 1 with all the instruments in there, and then let's listen to it um, soloed. Your friends say that they know what's best, but... So when we were, re were recording this part, we often referred to it as the jungle because of just like the vibe of having all, these, all this aux percussion. So now I'm going to solo it, and I'm going to play just the aux percussion so you can hear how much crazy shit is going on. So as you can hear, what's the panning like? Okay, so this is this is everything we got. For the most part, it's left, right, left, right, center. And then for the tambourines and the maracas and the shakers, I kind of do them 50, 40% somewhere in between. Again, I think this is a, an integral part of uh, this track's transitions and kind of what makes the chorus interesting there. When we were working on it, we were trying to think of like cool ways of making the chorus sound big and unique um, without just like throwing distorted guitars on it and making it just like some sort of rock song. Um, and I'm really stoked with how that turned out. That was probably, most of that was probably performed by my friend Joey. Um, and then the rest of it was probably performed by JJ, the drummer man. Check this out. Here we have cymbal swells. This is one of those uh, transitional things that I think really works in this track. If I play this part, uh, or if I play these solo, this is what it sounds like. So what we have there is two real deal cymbal swells that are completely or like different performances on the left and the right. And then we have like a reversed cymbal hit going out of it that I kind of created this part um, or I took all of those performances and created this one part out of it. Um, and the whole goal of this is to help the song transition and kind of have this like really nice flow to it. So this is just the low end. I like to do a split bass technique where I do the low end on one track and the high end on the other track. So this is just the low end. So if you're listening on laptop speakers, you might have a difficult time hearing that. Um, but that's just low end, just to occupy uh, what's going on down below. So let's play the drums in just the low end, just so you kind of kind of hear it all interacting. That's that, and then if I play the bass high by itself, this is gonna sound terrible. This is gonna sound no good because it's just like crappy high-end information. Let's play that without the low bass. High, bass, and the drums. So as you can hear, the purpose of that high bass track is just for the articulation just to cut. So even with the drums, you can kind of hear what the bass is doing. Um, so let's listen to the bass together with the drums. So the two, it's the same bass performance, but split into two tracks, processed differently. Um, they work together to create the illusion of 
a real bass guitar. Uh, that's rock bass. All right, let's jump into the guitars. Post Corey. <laughs> So that's the main little lead there, which is a nice, fun little lead. Then we have Brad. So these are probably both tracked on a um, Jazz Master, Fender Jazz Master. It's kind of become a sound of the band using Fender Jazz Master. They're just really articulate, they're very bright, and uh, they record really well. And we are probably both or 100% we are playing through PV VTMs, which are old amps from the 80s. Um, they're crappy amps. They they sound good. And uh, yeah, we've used them for years. We've used them on every single recording. Uh, it's what we use live. Brad, I think, paid $200 for his. I paid $400 for mine. Um, let's keep on moving forward. This Brad, or this, sorry, this SSL Flux track is in relation to Brad's verse. And I think it's... So, these guitars were tracked in a small room, um, no bigger than like the basement I'm in, and just to kind of add some like some depth to it, I like to throw a room mic as far away as I can, because um, it just adds a little bit of like it makes it sound like you're listening to it in the room. Um, so I'll put a close mic on the guitar cab, and then I'll put a room mic far away, even if it's not the best sounding room or the room doesn't have any personality. Just having both those mics panning one one way and then painting the room mic the opposite way um, just adds a little, little bit of depth so you don't have this kind of like sterile mix where when there's one guitar part playing, it's only on one side. Um, so as you can hear, this is Brad's main guitar part that starts the song. And just to kind of really create the illusion that this is being played in a room, I put a room mic, pan the other way, and turned quieter than Brad's uh, close mic. That's all there is to it. If you're listening on headphones, you can really hear how dramatic of a difference that is. Um, and even on top of that, I guess I was not satisfied with the sound of the room, so I put uh, just an impulse of, of a slightly larger room on it. So this is with nothing. You can really hear that there is no reverb in that room. There is, there's no personality. It's just like a faraway microphone on an amp. A little bit of fake room. Just makes it almost sound like it was played in like a bathroom, um, which adds a little bit of depth, which is really nice because this song, um, for the most part, or at least for the intro, um, there's only one guitar playing. So then we have Corey Verse here. Interesting. Okay, so on this first part, which is introduced halfway through the verse, when the bass comes in, like this. The, um, the, uh, I guess the tremolo effect is done with just the stock, uh, plug-in just to kind of create some movement on the guitar. And I strategically put it before a reverb, uh, because I wanted it to sound like the tremolo was a part of the amp sound and that the room was its own thing. If I wanted a more dramatic tremolo effect, I would have put the reverb before the gate, so then you'd have the reverb actually gating. But I wanted it to sound like a real guitar with a gate or with a tremolo, tremolo on it, and then that being performed in a room. We're moving down in the chorus here, so we have um, some stereo guitars, rhythm left, rhythm right, and what are these guitars? Let's give them a listen. <laughs> That sounds like I might have tracked that with my Kemper. By itself, to me, it doesn't sound like any sort of amazing guitar tone or anything. But in the mix, those are some really smooth sounding guitars. So let's hear it all together. I want to be totally reckless with you in suburban streets. Let's 
actually take a quick look at these. So going into the heavy part, when we had the heavy version of the song, I made this reverse reverb effect that uh, just kind of like went into this huge heavy lead that we had for this chorus that, you know, uh, doesn't exist. And it sounds like this. So that went into a big lead, um, but we actually can the lead. That lead does not exist, but I thought the reverse part still kind of worked going into the chorus. Um, so I guess there was something to be gained out of going through that entire process of burning a day, trying to make the song something it wasn't. Open and let the light in. Are your siblings still outside fighting? And that is... Um, that feedback thing there is also, that's the exact same thing. So both of those come from um, a version of the chorus or the anti-chorus that uh, no longer exists. But just keeping those like reverse swells before everything really helps the transition. Um, and to really drive home that transition, we've already talked about it, but I'll play all the transitional effects together. We have cymbal swells, we have a floor tom swell, and then we have two reverse guitar leads. And without everything soloed, it sounds like this. Open and let the light in. Are your siblings still outside fighting? I want to be told. Smooth. All right, that just about sums up guitars. We do have these ambience tracks here. Um, and I think every song on this record has, I guess, some, some layer of ambience tracks that we kind of created for the song. And let me just listen to these. Iconic. If you are familiar with the song and you hear that intro, you instantly know what it is. Um, I think we made these either with my Nunabar Shimmer pedal or we made them with a uh, Electro Harmonics Cathedral. Let's go into the vocals. So when we track the vocals for the song, this was actually after tracking... I don't remember specifically, but it was either after tracking, let's say, like a super intense song um, or after a long day of just tracking in general. I remember Brad's voice was a little fatigued, but in the best way, which kind of created like a natural, added like natural harmonic content to his voice. I find when you're working with a vocalist, um, it takes like at least half an hour or so to like really find the sweet spot. And in this case, I've recorded Brad many times at this point. Um, there's, there's just this point where he, his, his soft voice sounds like really, really nice. And um, just out of happenstance, we got there for this track. So let's uh, solo this verse vocal here. That ain't soloed. Here we go. Let's solo this verse vocal. There's a white fence now in the rundown yard of my first house and it all changed. It's getting harder and harder to say. So as you can hear, just by itself, sounds pretty damn good. In this first part here, there is another vocal introduced. And these are called highs, and I believe these are falsettos. Do you feel Whoa, glitching out. So this is in the same octave, but it's just a falsetto voicing of the vocal to kind of add some glow, some lushness to it. Um, so let's play it from here. It's getting harder and harder to say. Do you feel at home whenever you draw the windows open and let the light in? Are your siblings still out? So, this is a little texture. Um, we didn't want to complicate it with harmonies and making it kind of like sound like multiple voices at this point of the song, but we did want to add something to kind of add to it. So blending in a falsetto of Brad's voice singing the same thing, it's it's um, the melody, just in a different voicing um, with tons of reverb, um, achieved what we were going for. So this is what that sounds like. <laughs> Chorus, we have three main vocals. 
That's how I always do it. I call them CLR, center, left, right. It's the same vocal singing, singing the exact same thing. I pan one center, one left, one right. Um, and what that does is it makes uh, the chorus sound like a chorus, makes the vocal sound big. Uh, you want the timing to be really tight, and you want uh, the tuning to be really tight as well. Those are two important things to kind of uh, keep it all locked in so it doesn't sound like a million voices. And um, then you want the left and right vocal turned quieter. Um, then the center vocals. So this is what that sounds like. I want to be totally reckless with you in suburban streets Breaking into houses where we used to live and sleeping under strangers sheets And sometimes I do this probably more now than at the point when I was working on this um, on the doubled vocals I really like to cut out the breaths because those they get really annoying they get really really annoying when you have like three different breaths before every single line so you can see here at the start i cut out the breath i cut out the breath so we have some stereo harmonies that are introduced on these notes here um let's hear what those sound like breaking into houses where we used to live that's that i also if you've seen the other in the mix videos for any other locket songs uh, you know that i do this but i also like to do what i call lows and highs and the highs are just falsettos of the main vocal and the lows are just like low voicings of the main vocal um, you track two of each and you pan them left right and what it does is it just kind of uh, makes the vocal sound bigger you tuck them in they don't need to be too loud but it just kind of adds a fullness this is what those sound like I want to be totally reckless with you in suburban streets. And as you can tell, I tune that really hard. Not because it was sung out of tune or like terribly out of tune, but uh, when you have all these layers together, these layers that aren't going to be poking out very much, having them just like totally locked in, in tune kind of leaves, like it cleans everything up and leaves room for the, uh, the main vocals to shine. If those were like a little pitchy, it would kind of distract from the main vocals and no bueno so that's that and then also through this chorus we have just this gentle ah yep i don't know whose idea that was um but that's what we did so let's uh let's give that a listen throw um with all the vocals unless there's some some reason for it some stylistic reason i like to center left right um so the main vocal center uh the left right main vocals are panned left right the highs and lows are panned left right and the harmonies are also panned left right so it just leaves room for everything else to kind of be where it needs to be <laughs> oh yeah in this part here so this is just one vocal. Your friends say that they know what's best, but I don't think that's true. We In this <laughs> we added these whoa oh oh oh's. Now this was my silly idea to make Brad do that. I think he was a little hesitant to do it. And honestly, I still don't really know how I feel about about it. But it's in there and it's released to the public, so game on. Oh yeah. Okay, we spent a lot of time to get this count right. This is hilarious. So this is JJ yelling, and we wanted to make it sound um, like JJ was sitting on the drum kit and like yelling two, three, four, going into the next part. So JJ, the drummer, uh, we got him to like yell, and his voice cracked, and we we're like, "That's the one." So this is that. Sorry, JJ. Two, three, four. <laughs> That's a straight up voice crack. Just the fun things you do when you lock yourself in a room for a month. So this is V-Flux. If you tuned in at the start of the stream, you know the word flux means distorted for no reason. Um, and uh, that's what it is. This is a distorted vocal. So the next time you pass through, could you remember how we... Through it through a guitar amp. And now to the wall depicting everything we're running from. So if home's where the heartache is, I hope that the next time you pass through, it won't feel that way for you. Listening back to the song, 
um, when I'm when I'm working on I guess any song, but specifically with with uh, my band, I, we try and make every kind of part of the production interesting. And when I'm working on the vocals, I kind of treat every section like its own individual part. And you're trying to make, do something to make it interesting. So whether it's in the vocal layering and the arrangement and the lack of layering like the contrast between parts. And for some reason in the bridge, I decided to distort it and no one in the band had an issue with it. So that is why it is the way it is. And I think it's because we had these other vocals that play off it. And it was just kind of getting them all to be their own thing to make it like a really interesting listening experience. So this is, these are all the vocals in that section together. Could you remember how we framed ourselves when we were young? And nail to the walls, depicting everything we're running from. Yeah, so it's just, just to add some intensity to that, the, the more intense vocal. Is there a reason to keep the cab on that amp? Yes. If you take the cab off, it's probably going to sound very, very fuzzy. Um, and let's experiment with that. Cabinet. No cabinet. So the next time you no bueno. Cabinet. So the next time you Much better. If, okay, that is basically the track. We've gone through all the individual elements. I have the session open. I'll stick around for another 15 minutes or so. Um, if anybody has any questions, now is um, the time to do so. I will jump in. I will click around. Otherwise, thank you for tuning in.